What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of the Dolphins in Depth Podcast. I'm Daniel Yafusi. Thanks so much for tuning in. Quick reminder before we start, make sure to subscribe to the Miami Herald YouTube page, like, share, comment, as well subscribe to the Miami Herald. Uh, now, as you can see, uh, I'm running solo this week. We've got a jam-packed episode for you today. Uh, I'm currently recording from Orlando, Florida, a uh, home of the 2024 uh, NFL Annual Owners Meeting. Uh, we had a news filled day uh, on the first real day of the owners meeting uh, earlier Monday uh, the AFC coaches spoke um, at the morning brunch or uh, morning breakfast uh, and that included Mike McDaniel was the first time uh, we were able to speak to the Dolphins coach uh, since the combine in late February uh, obviously a lot has happened since then uh, especially uh, with free agency a lot of departures um, a lot of incoming uh, new players to South Florida. Uh, so we got Mike McDaniel's comments um, on the first wave of free agency, um, some potential additions, as well as some other topics that we're going to get into over the course uh, uh, of this pod today, this week. Uh, but we got to start uh, with some news that broke um, just a couple of days after we last recorded with David Neal. Um, that uh, is obviously the news regarding the Dolphins and wide receiver Odell Beckham Jr., the three-time Pro Bowler, uh, one of the biggest names in the sport. Uh, just uh, last week, it came out, or our own Barry Jackson reported uh, that the Dolphins are interested um, in the 31-year-old wide receiver. Uh, he actually came on a visit uh, down in South Florida, where he actually spends a lot of his time with his family and training and whatnot, um, but he left without a, uh, a deal. Now, for the first time uh, on the record, we got Mike McDaniel um, commenting on that, and he did confirm that an offer has been made to Beckham. Um, now, obviously, he said that uh, business takes time. Um, you know, that's something that you have to work out. Um, but he uh, is kind of hopeful that the Dolphins and Odell Beckham Jr. will come to an agreement to bring him to Miami, uh, put him in a Dolphins uniform. Um, I'm going to give you the exact quote from earlier uh, Monday. Mike McDaniel said things went great with him. We did make him an offer, and business takes business takes time, uh, especially with players such as Odell, who's had a phenomenal career, still has really good football in front of him, and has options. So I think those conversations will be ongoing. We'll see where they go. He continued, I don't live in the world of crystal balling, and I do stay in my lane as a coach. I'm definitely ready to coach him if we can come to an agreement, and I think both sides are trying to work towards that. We'll see what happens um now if you have been paying attention to the dolphins in that podcast especially last week um i made the argument that uh number three wide receiver is one of the most one of the more important remaining holes for the dolphins and even before free agency opened um if you've read my work i've listened to the pod you know that i've on multiple occasions have spoken about the dolphins need to add a number three wide receiver behind Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle. Now, obviously, uh, Miami did sign Johnny Smith, who really fills that pass-catching tight end role. I think that that will allow them uh, to kind of dive into more 12 personnel sets with two tight ends and whatnot. Um, but I think they really need, needed some juice to complement, uh, you know, Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle. And I really like the possibility of the Dolphins adding Odo Beckham Jr. Now, it's just kind of take a step back and look at kind of the state of the Dolphins wide receiver room. As I said before, you have Tyree Kill, you have Jalen Waddle, but truthfully not a lot behind that. Cedric Wilson Jr., who kind of filled that number three role for most of last year, um, he's gone. He signed with the New Orleans Saints. The Dolphins did re-sign River Craycraft uh, and Braxton Berrios, um, but I think that everyone would say that, you know, in, in moments when we saw Tyree Kill and J or Jalen Waddle go down or, you know, their snaps were reduced, um, the Dolphins definitely could use a little more uh, dynamic ability. Um, now, is Odell Beckham Jr., um, the Odell, the OBJ of, you know, 2014, 2015, 2016, when he made three Pro Bowls, um, when he was the talk of the NFL and he was viewed um, as a bona fide number one, wide, number one wide receiver? He's not. He's not a number one wide receiver. Is he a number two wide receiver? I would make the argument that he's not a number two wide receiver, although we did see him a couple years back uh, with the Los Angeles Rams um, and a very high volume passing offense, kind of similar to the to the Dolphins. Um, we saw him be a very, very productive number two behind Cooper Cup uh, in Los Angeles, catching passes for Matt Stafford. Um, and truthfully, I mean, he said it himself. He thought he was on his uh, he was on his way to winning MVP honors um, a couple years back in the Super Bowl. Now, obviously, we saw what happened with him tearing his ACL. 
Um, he goes down that um, that path of rehab. Um, he misses pretty much an entire year, and then he comes back with the Ravens, um, where he I think that he puts together a respectable year. Truthfully, thirty five catches, close to six hundred yards, um, three touchdowns. Um, the sixteen point yard, uh, sixteen point one yard per catch average was actually the highest of his career. Now the thing is. He the Ravens signed him to a one year fifteen million dollar deal. So when you kind of look at stack up the production next to the contract that he got, um, I I think you would say yeah, like that definitely was a little bit of a over overpay. And right now, you know, the compensation, the money, the financial terms are, are really the sticking point. Um, I don't think that he's going to get fifteen million dollars from the Dolphins. I don't think the Dolphins are in a position to give their number three wide receiver, uh, and somebody that's going to be clearly be their number three wide receiver fifteen million dollars. Um, but I do think that there's, there's a sweet spot that they can. And, you know, my little prediction, prediction prediction is that they will um, find that sweet spot to get Odell um, down here. But how does he fit in this offense? Again, um, go back to the Dolphins need somebody that has that has juice. Again, he might not have that that game-breaking speed from his prime, um, but there were multiple occasions where he was able to catch the ball, separate from DBs. We saw, um, you know, we saw that that run after catch ability that Michael, uh, that Mike McDaniel loved so much. We saw that in Baltimore. Um, I think that when, when Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle um, are off the field, and we know that this is an offense and this is a coaching staff that definitely staggers their, their snaps to keep them fresh and healthy, I think that you don't have as much of a drop-off when you take Tyree Kill or Jalen Waddle off the field, and now you still have these two wide receiver sets but now it's Odell and Jalen Waddle or it's Odell and Tyree Kill instead of you know uh Tyree Kill and Cedric Wilson or Braxton Berrios whoever Craycraft um I think that he is a very smart wide receiver who knows how to find uh the holes and zones the Dolphins face a lot of zone because of that speed I think that if he's a guy that he can play outside he can play inside but I kind of like him working inside on the number three wide receiver and if you're playing some zone you know he can find uh the kind of the soft spots in those zones and kind of be a friendly uh a friendly pass catcher for Tua Tungo Bailoa if they play some man I think he's a guy that can beat man again is he the wide receiver separator of yesteryear of his prime he's not but hey I mean we saw it up close uh you know just a couple months ago when the Dolphins played the Ravens in Baltimore we saw his ability um to make some tough catches um he's a guy that doesn't drop a lot of passes I mean hey he his claim to fame was a one-handed catch in coverage um and I'm not saying that he's going to do that you know every single week but we have seen his uh he is a guy who can make some tough catches um and, and kind of come through for his wide receiver uh for for his quarterback um again is he a guy who you're expecting to catch six seven passes a game in this offense no but you don't need that. I think that you kind of need just one or two plays a game where he comes through uh, when Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waller are bracketed um, and, and you know, he can separate on one-on-one -on -one, or he can find uh, the soft spot in his zone to make a tough catch. Um, I really, really, really like that. Um, is it a is it a needle mover? I don't know about a needle mover. I I, I don't want to go that far. I don't want to say a, a number three wide receiver is a needle mover. Um but if they're able to add Odell before the draft, that puts them in such a good position when it comes to uh to the draft. Um, you know, we've been talking about the potential for them, um, you know, maybe drafting a wide receiver at 21 at 55. I'm not saying that, you know, that's you know, that becomes out of the question, um, you know, if they add Odell. Um, but it really does allow you to to attack some other parts of the of the of the a team that I think that really need to be addressed, and specifically the trenches, whether that's offensive line, defensive line. I think that if you add Odell, you are most certainly in uh, what I called last week best player on the trenches available position um, where you can get a tackle, you can get a guard, you can get another defensive tackle to try to compensate for um, the departure of Christian Wilkins and Raekwon Davis. Um, so I'm banging the table for this uh, for this move. I think that it would be a home run slam dunk move. Um, and Mike McDaniel kind of alluded to it before. Um, you know the the construction of this roster is not um, is is not complete, and the nature of the moves that they make over the course of the coming months are going to shape the identity of this roster. He 
alluded to, hey, if we add another a number three wide receiver or an additional wide receiver, maybe we can do those wide uh, those three wide receiver sets and we can be a little more effective and allow this to evolve. You know, he's talked about this evolution of the offense um, that takes place every single year. I think that um, the signing of, as I alluded to before, the signing of John U. Smith uh, potentially allows them to do more 12 personnel, something that they have not done at all um, since Mike McDaniel arrived. Maybe it, you know, signals that they're going to be able to throw the ball to the tight end some more, which they have not done since Mike McDaniel arrived. They also haven't run a ton of three wide receiver sets, which is mainly because they were really, really major in that 21 personnel with two running backs, usually um, uh, usually Alec Ingold as the, the second running back. Um, but hey, you're like, maybe if you add Odell, you can diversify your skill set. Maybe it opens up some, some more stuff from the run because we're in those wide receiver uh, uh, sets. Um, you know, you have to add more DBs. Maybe you have to play more more off coverage, more zone coverage, some more too high safety looks. And maybe it allows you to run the ball a lot better. So I really do like um, the addition of Odell. And the last thing I'll say on um, the additions, I know, you know, just kind of scrolling through, through X, Twitter, whatever you want to call it. I know a lot of folks. Um, we're saying well, one, I saw a lot of Dolphins fans saying that Odell is washed. And I think like, I don't know, I think that washed is kind of one of those overused terms, like in our lexicon today. Um, and, and I'll kind of allude to what I said before, where is Odell, you know, prime 25, 24 year old Odell? Um, no, but can he contribute to winning in a specific role that doesn't ask him to do more than he is capable of? I think so. And I think that coming to Miami um, would be um, a great addition um, personnel wise. The second thing I'll, I'll say is that I saw a lot of people saying, you know, he's a headache. He's a diva. We don't need more head cases. We don't need this, that. He's a bad locker room guy. And I would just say personally from you know, you know, from my past, you know, following the Ravens, even following them this year, from people I know in the organization, from what I've read, from what I've seen, um, that couldn't be farther from the truth. Um, I know that he definitely um has that that uh that's that, you know, he's carried that stigma um with him over the past, over the course of his career because of, you know, some of the incidents that we saw early on in his career with the Giants. Um, but from what I've seen, from what I've read, um, he seems like a very mature player much more mature than he was in years past somebody who has a different perspective um you know on himself on his role um and i'll say from what i read from you know whether it was coach john harbaugh um from whether it was um some of the other wide receivers in the room he was nothing but a consummate professional professional in that locker room um there was a lot of talk about how he mentored zay flowers um the ravens number one number one wide receiver uh in the draft last year um how he was a a great locker room presence um and really a, a mature veteran presence that that group needed last year um and, and we all know that um you know the dolphins are really big on that having guys that aren't guys I, I don't see him as a B guy even though that's something that uh maybe he, he's carried as a stigma over the past couple of years um so those are just kind of like my last uh two thoughts uh on the Odell Beckham signing um it'll be interesting to see what the timeline for it, it is I mean the Dolphins don't really need to rush at all um you know he won't count toward the compensatory pick formula if anybody's asking I know that we've been kind of monitoring that um you know this offseason he doesn't count towards towards that because he already revised his contract to add void years and stuff like that. Um, so the Dolphins can sign him at any time. It just seems like it's coming down to the money. Uh, like McDaniel said himself, that um, he has options. Um, so we'll see. Um, but in terms of the available wide receivers, I think that this would be a, a slam dunk um, the signing for the Dolphins um, in this offense in 2024. All right, we're going to take a short break, but when we come back on the other side of things, we're going to, I'm going to hit on some other uh, Dolphins related items uh, from day one at the NFL annual owners meeting uh, in Orlando. So stay locked and I'll be back soon. What's going on, everybody? Still here on the Dolphins and the podcast talking all things Dolphins on the first half. Uh, I broke down uh, the developing news about the Dolphins and Odell Beckham Jr., um, who visited Miami's facility last week um, and has received an offer, um, but is yet to sign. Talks are ongoing um, with the three-time Pro Bowler, uh, according to Coach Mike McDaniel. And I want to um, dive into some other Dolphins-related stuff from um, the AFC coaches breakfast uh, early Monday morning. Um, again, we got Mike McDaniel for about 30 minutes. And again, it was the first time since free agents, or excuse me, since uh, the combine in late February that we were able to talk to Mike McDaniel or really anybody, um, any one of the Dolphins uh, brass. Uh, so we got a lot, a lot of news um, from just that half hour. Uh, Mike McDaniel 
Theo today, a very interesting question about the state um, of Tua Tungabailoa's contract negotiations. Now, as you all know, um, Miami and Tua's agent have been discussing the terms of an extension uh, since the end of the 2023 season. There's no timeline for the deal. Um, and, you know, this is something that could could take some time. If you look back at some of the recent quarterback deals um, in recent years, um, even last year, a lot of those deals got done um, late in the spring into the summer, you know, just days before uh, the season started. So, um, you know, Chris Greer, general manager, said himself, these deals take time. They're not rushing it. However, um, Tua is entering a contract year. He's entering the final year of his rookie deal, the fifth year option. And with that, um, Mike McDaniel was asked whether Tua Tagovailoa or whether he expected Tua Tagovailoa to be in attendance for the start of the team's offseason workout program. That kicks up uh, April 15th um, and, you know, takes them well into uh, well into June. Uh, Mike McDaniel despite, you know, the contract talks, said he fully expects Tua Tagovailoa to be um, in attendance when they start. This was the exact quote. He goes, I do expect him to be in OTAs because of my working relationship with Tua. Um, and for two years, I've watched Tua gain some un unbelievable residuals toward the season in that process. It's part of the reason Tua is who he is, because he's always learning, never staying the same, and always working on his craft. Uh, he continued, I don't really put too much thought beyond that. I understand the business. But I also understand with my job with Tua is to make sure that his football is continuing to evolve and the best days are in front of him, which is both of our goals. Um, I don't think there was too much of a surprise with that, with those comments. And no, I was good to obviously get it on the record that Mike McDaniel expects Tua to be um, in attendance. There won't be any, you know, negotiating ploy or contract or any issues kind of born out of uh, the contract negotiations, which by all accounts seem to be very amicable um, and to be going along, you know, swimmingly um, as, you know, as well as contract negotiations have. Um, but I do bring that up um, because earlier in the, the, the talk during the breakfast, Mike McDaniel was asked about um, the handling of extension talks with a pair of homegrown talents who did not resign with the team and had just recently left um, in free agency, that being um, Christian Wilkins and Robert Hunt. I thought it was very interesting the way Mike McDaniel answered those que answered that question because you know he 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 acknowledges that hey like these aren't these new deals these extensions weren't something that just kind of snuck up on us and we just recently started uh, engaging in them and and that's correct because you know the Dolphins were engaged. Uh, in extension talks with Christian Wilkins and Robert Hunt at different points of the last year. Obviously, um, they were talking with Christian Wilkins before the start of the 2023 season. Um, and Mike, uh, excuse me, Chris Greer said that um, he had talks with Robert Hunt's agent um, during the 2023 season. Um, but both players got or received deals that while the Dolphins thought they were fair, um, they didn't think was, you know, the peak of their value. They bet on themselves. They played the seasons out. They got to free agency and they cashed out. Christian Wilkins, four years, $110 million. Um, Rob Hunt, I believe it's five years, $100 million. So these guys bet on themselves and they fully won. Um, and I think that the natural um, reaction from a lot of Dolphins fans and you know, just outsiders was like, why is why is it that we have these homegrown talents who um, – are playing well and we're not locking them up because, you know, for the past couple of years, the Dolphins have been, you know, grooming young talent and getting them um, and, and, and developing them. Um, and now they were really for the first time in kind of this rebuild, they were in a position where um, kind of the, the building blocks of that rebuild were up where, where it's time for them to re up. And I think that it was definitely kind of odd to see a uh, guy like Christian Wilkins and Robert Hunt and guys who have been, um, you know, really gone through this whole, this whole period, this whole era with the Dolphins um, signed elsewhere um, but, you know, I think McDaniel made a very fair point with the salary cap and the salary cap is real, despite what people might want to say, it is very real. The Dolphins are a clear example of that. And some of the moves that they made and some of the moves they were not able to make, he pointed out that, Hey, money spent in this spot is money that can't be spent in another spot. And for the Dolphins, if they were going to commit, um, you know, close to 20, 25 plus million dollars, um, to Christian Wilkins, $20 million to Rob Hunt over the next couple of years. 
Um, while yes, they that would have meant that they would have kept some homegrown talents. I think that um, with the nature of the Dolphins' financial situation, the salary cap, and the guys that they have upcoming, that would have significantly um, hindered their ability to build a cohesive roster. That's something that Mike McDaniel touched on a lot of times, like the signing and, and he, he kind of said it without saying it like signing those guys to those types of deals um would have really hamstrung the dolphins ability to build a complete roster so obviously when those guys leave you know your roster gets depleted and then you have to replace them um but we saw the dolphins we saw how the dolphins kind of operated in the first wave of free agency signing some vets um kind of some low cost deals but potentially high value and i think that's what we're going to see that's what we're going to see this year maybe even next year because they have some guys coming up but Bringing it all, tying it all together, um, I Mc, McDaniel said that the contract negotiations with Christian Wilkins and Rob Hunt um, don't really change the way, um, won't really change the process for the Dolphins in terms of future negotiations, um, because every negotiation is 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 unique in its own right. But I do think that um, there is one lesson to be taken from um, those two situations, and I think that. Sometimes it's better to be ahead of the curve and maybe overpay for a guy in the moment than maybe stick to your perceived dollar point, dollar amount, um, and what you be, believe is fair market value. I say that because I look at what has happened, what has transpired with uh, the wide receiver market in the past couple of years. I look at um, T Higgins or, or well, T Higgins being up for a lucrative contract. I look at Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson. I look at the deal that uh, Michael Pittman just got from the Indianapolis coach, $20 million. I mean, I look at the deal that Calvin Ridley just got from the Tennessee Titans, you know, upwards of $20 million, $23, $25 million. Um, and, you know, my first reaction, my first thought when I saw the Calvin Ridley deal was the Dolphins should have signed or the Dolphins should sign Jalen Waddle yesterday like they need to be on that immediately um now obviously they have the fifth year option for Jalen Waddle which gives them some time to work out a long-term deal and maybe kind of like kick that can down the road but I think that I think that they should kind of learn from uh what just happened with Christian Wilkins and um obviously again Christian Wilkins declined a deal that the Dolphins said was very fair um but he thought you know he could get a little bit more and he was definitely able to get a little bit more um truthfully if I was the Dolphins I would sign um i would sign jalen waddle to a deal in excess of 25 million dollars like today yesterday if i could go back in time but i can't so today um and i would make sure that he is sealed up for the next five years um chris greer has on multiple occasions said that he believes Jalen Waddle is a is a um, part of their future, is a core part of their future. He's alluded to multiple guys who are up next for extensions. Obviously, Waddle was one of those guys, with, along with Tua Tungabailoa, Javon Holland, and Jalen Phillips when he gets back healthy. Um, but I look at the wide receiver market, and I look at what T. Higgins might get. Um, you know, he obviously he's dealing with a franchise tag situation and requested a trade. Um, but I just think about what he might get. I think about the fact that um, Jamar Chase and Justin, Justin Jefferson might be the first wide receivers in NFL history to get at least thirty million dollars. Um, and I think that, um, and I think that while you might not say Jalen Waddle is is a better wide receiver, a better player than those two guys, he might or whether he's not on the same tier. Um, we just saw with Christian Wilkins that the market is the market. Um, and when guys at the top get paid, that just increases the floor for everybody else coming up behind them. Um, I would love to see the Dolphins get ahead of that, be proactive, not reactive, and signing one of their top guys. And I think the same thing goes for Tua. Um, you know, I wrote a piece a couple of weeks back about what uh, a deal for Tua might look like. Um, and we see these these quarterback deals um, increasing so much especially over the past couple of years, increasing at a rate greater than the, than the salary cap. And we just saw recently, um, last year, multiple uh, quarterbacks signed new deals, averaging uh, at least $50 million. The highest paid quarterback right now is uh, is Joe Burrow with the Bengals, who makes uh, 50, $55 million a year on average. Um, and again, whatever you want to say about Tua, he might not be on the same tier as you know Joe Burrow, Lamar Jackson, um, you know, Josh Allen, Pat, whatever, but um, again, his time has come to be paid. And I think that um, you look at a situation where you have some of his peers who are going to get paid 
Um, I think that there's some other guys who are definitely could sign new deals this offseason, whether it's Trevor Lawrence, whether it's Dak Prescott, Jared Goff, um, um, and Jordan Love, some others. You know, when most guys get paid, um, the, the ceiling or excuse me, the floor just increases. The number just increases for, for Tua and his agent. Um, and, and I think that, you know, while a deal averaging over $50 million and close to $60 million might look crazy and might, you know, make a, do- a lot of Dolphins fans kind of fall out of their seat with their uh, with their uh, mouth wide open. I think that um, as the salary cap increases, um, this that that deal won't look as crazy in two, three years. Shoot, they might not look crazy in a couple months if you sign them right now and kind of get ahead of the curve, kind of get ahead of the the the, the quarterback boom, uh, so to speak. Um, so that's kind of what stuck out to me when uh McDaniel was talking about Tua's contract, you know, him expecting to him expecting him to be at OTAs and kind of the lessons learned or maybe um how things aren't really going to change as much with contract talks because of what happened with Christian Wilkins and Bob Hunt. I think that some things kind of should change um, if, if if you're the Dolphins. And I and again, I've said it multiple times, if Tua is your guy, whatever you want to say about Tua, however you stand on the Tua debate, if you're the Dolphins and Tua is your guy, there should be no hesitation in giving him a top of the market deal that not only makes him the highest paid player in franchise history, but makes him one of if not the most high if not the most highest paid or uh, if not the highest paid player uh in the nfl i know that it is a it is a tough pill to swallow it is a tough financial pill to swallow um but you're either in or you're out on your guy you know it's not it's not i said it before it's not you're not you're not giving him a daniel jones contract you're either giving him a top of the market deal or you're giving him no deal um so that's how i feel about that um all right, one last thing before we get out of here. Um, Mike McDaniel, um, the issue of play calling uh, at the end of the 2023 season, uh, McDaniel was asked whether he would you know, consider giving up and relinquishing play calling so he can focus on other game day duties. Um, he said he was open to that. He was asked Monday morning um, if he would made a decision, and he said he thought long and hard about it. But um, he has decided or he plans to call plays in the spring during – off-season workouts and in the fall obviously when the season starts um the exact quote was I thought about it long and hard and I think one of the things we've done this offseason is really lean in the, into the facilitation of fuller communication and development of our staff in all three phases I think from play calling from a play calling perspective for now in the spring I'm going to call plays I plan on doing it in the fall but we'll always adjust if necessary um me personally I never thought that that was like a, a serious thing to consider um does Mike McDaniel have his uh his weak weak points and things that he needs to work on? Yes, and I've said multiple occasions. I think that he'd be the first to let you know there are things that he needs to work on. Has he improved as a play caller from year one to year two? Yes. Does he have more year to grow? Does he has more have more room to grow? Yes. But I think we got to remember, like literally in his entering his third year, falling plays like on his own, like he didn't have that role. Um, entirely when he was with the San Francisco 49ers. Um, he's doing that now in Miami. Um, yes, the Dolphins have struggled against top defenses, um, but they also did finish number one in yards. Or then, I mean, that, that has to count for something. I know you'd like to see it um, kind of play out more in some of their best performances against the better teams when the stakes are the highest. Um, but I think that Mike McDaniel has done a lot more good than bad. And I just feel like if he was to take – if he was to relinquish play calling duties or if somebody above him was to strip play calling duties above him um, from him so that he can focus more on, you know, when to make a, when to throw a challenge flag, when to call a timeout or other game day um, responsibilities. Um, Just think about it this way. Is Mike McDaniel best served as an offensive play caller on game day, calling the plays with the play sheet um, in addition to, you know, trying to manage, um, the game day responsibilities, just like every other, just about every other offensive play calling coach does, um, or are the Dolphins better off with him, you know, doing the, the, during the week game planning and then just kind of twiddling his thumbs and making a decision on when to throw a flag or call a timeout as Frank Smith calls plays. Now it's not to take anything from Frank Smith, um, but Mike McDaniel is the architect of this offense. He is the person that has built the scheme around Tua Tungabaloa, around Tyree Kill, around Jalen Waddle, around so many other players. Um, I think that, um, the Dolphins are better served with him still calling the plays, despite whatever game day play clock clock issues that there that arises. He's not the only one that has this issue. 
Um, Andy Reid has been criticized for having issues with play clock ma management. Um, you know, um, a lot of other offensive play calling coaches have come upon this issue. And I just think that the Dolphins are better served uh, and are better a better team when Mike McDaniel is calling the plays as opposed to if you were not to call the plays. That's how I feel on it. Obviously, we'll see um, how he grows as a play caller again. They talk about a lot of growth from the players, from the scheme and whatnot. You know, a lot of the growth is coming from Mike McDaniel as well. Um, he's still a very, very young coach. And I think that um, while there's a lot of frustration with how the past two seasons have ended, especially last season, um, I think we should remind ourselves that um, he is still young, a young coach uh, within himself, and he's growing and learning um, and fixing mistakes and whatnot. So um, that's my piece on it. And we'll see how they, uh, how he fares in his third year as an offensive play caller. All right, that brings us to the end of another edition of the Dolphins in Depth podcast. I want to thank you guys as always for tuning in. Reminder to subscribe to the Miami Herald YouTube page, like, share, comment, as well subscribe to the Miami Herald. Um, I'll still be in Orlando on Tuesday at the NFC coaches um, have their uh, their morning breakfast. Uh, might get some insight on some of the newest Dolphins coming over from the NFC teams, as well as other developments at the annual uh, owners league meeting. Um, I'll be back next week to recap another week of Dolphins football and developments and news, et cetera. Until then, you guys take care. See you.